As a world, we face some pretty big challenges. Global warming, 10 billion people showing up, histories of conflict. And we have tactics to address each of these. But collectively, we lack the political capital to do so. We have a global shortage of the political capital where it's needed in order to take action to overcome each of these challenges. The good thing, though, is that when people talk to each other, understanding can be created, and under the right circumstances, action can follow. So, but how did we get here? Madison thought that the only way to scale democracy would be through representative democracy. But the challenge with representative democracy is that politicians are still constrained by the political facts on the ground. They still have to face elections, and they still have to listen to what voters want. And when you're only one vote in millions, it's, it's, it's very easy to not think. And it's, it's very easy to not have to take the time to figure out exactly what you should think. And a few years ago, we were, it was very exciting because there was the aspiration that merely having access to information on the World Wide Web would allow us all to become fully educated about what the issues were that we should think through when making our votes. But the challenge, as Cass Sunstein has shown in his research, is that with all this access to information, all too frequently we seek out more information that supports what we already believe. We seek out the facts that reinforce what we already think. And so this challenge is well measured by when a few years ago there was a survey taken of Americans about what they thought of the Public Affairs Act of 1975. And 44% of Americans said that they were either for it or against it even though it didn't exist. <laughs> it was a fictitious act and it was made up, and if that's the signal we're measuring, then we're making decisions based on the noise and the feedback, but not based on what we need to in order to have a functioning society. So, growing up, my dad was a great believer in John Stuart Mill's notion that in order to really have autonomy, we must hear all of the arguments on all the sides of whatever it is we're thinking about. So he came up with an approach called the deliberative poll, in which you take a random sample of a population, a state, a country, or a continent, you, you survey them about what they think, and then you get together a group of experts, diverse, disagreeing experts, to create briefing materials with all the arguments for and against all of these different options under consideration. You then bring this random sample, several hundred people, together in one place for a weekend. You have them gather in small group discussions with a moderator where they can share their views. And you will give them a chance to ask questions of experts to ensure that the, the conversations are based on the best information available. And at the end of the weekend, you survey them again. This doesn't measure what the public thinks the way an opinion poll does. This measures what the public would think if the public were thinking. <laughs> so this has been done dozens of times around the world. In Texas, it was done on energy policy. And it was found that when people understood what demand side conservation was, they were willing to support tactics like double-plated uh, windows. When they were able to understand the trade-offs about renewable energy choices, they were willing to shift in a very significant way towards being willing to pay a little bit more on their electricity bill if they knew that the electricity included renewable sources for a larger share of their electricity than it otherwise would. And so the Texas Utility Commission took this information and took this 
th this um, answer to the question of what the people of Texas would think if they were thinking about energy policy. And they passed the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard, which brought Texas from 49th in the country in wind power to first in the country in wind power within 10 years. So the deliberative poll is not limited necessarily by language. I remember witnessing the cacophony of languages that were present at the European-wide deliberative poll in which do two dozen languages were spoken. And with real-time translation, there was a coherent result of people thinking about what the future of the continent could look like. And I've even seen um, in Northern Ireland that deliberation is possible, even in a place with such a deep history of conflict, people can come to understand each other. After they talked to each other, there was a major shift towards people being willing to place their children together in school. That's the kind of infrastructure that a generation later can create the relationships that are needed to pre prevent future conflict. They were even, there was even a major shift in the opinions of these folks towards being willing to accept that if they were Catholic, that Protestants were open to reason, and vice versa. That's possible, even in a place with a history as challenging as Oman. So I'm going to take a step back for a moment and share that a few years ago, I was reading a book and writing in the margins of my, that book. And I was thinking to myself, I can't have been the first person to do this. So I ended up thinking, what did other, what did other thinkers, what did other authors scribble in the margins of the same book? And I ended up looking at four years, what did Tolstoy, George Eliot, Charles Darwin, E. Cummings, C.S. Lewis, and 30 other great authors scribble in their copies of Shakespeare? And what fascinated me about this was that they each used a shared practice. They used the position on the page in order to indicate what they were referring to. Even in the course of hundreds of years of annotation, they shared that habit because it let them understood what they were referring to when they wanted to return back to the text years later. And they would have conversations in the text. George Eliot with both husband and later other individuals in the margin of her text. They would talk back to each other in the text. And so I created a technology and a company, Reframe It, that lets people annotate digital content, letting thousands or millions of people annotate the same text, add their comments by highlighting a sentence and sharing their comments next to anyone else who needs to see that sentence and see what people said about that, that portion of the text. Now, the deliberative poll is a extraordinary process for allowing people to come to understanding with one another. But it only gets hundreds of people involved. It measures and represents what the entire public would think if it were thinking, because it has attitude on every dimension. It is representative attitudinally, demographically, in every other regard, they are a microcosm of the society, but it is only hundreds of people. And other people in society also want to have their voice counted, and they also want to have their insights get involved. But when you try to scale deliberation to a huge scale, like a country, you end up with other challenges. When the GOP invited people in America to submit their suggestions for public policy, and let anyone in the country rate those suggestions. One of the top policies in the country was to replace the US military with the Monty Python Knights of the Holy Grail. <laughs> if that's our method of measuring what the people think, and if that's our basis upon which we can gather the insights and incorporate them into our ability to take action, then we're not going to be able to do it. But the good thing is that the process can be structured in such a way as that's not the end result. What if we begin with the deliberative poll, a secure way of consulting the public, but then invite everyone else in society to add their annotations onto the results of the deliberative poll, onto the briefing materials, so that they can ask questions next to the arguments for and against every alternative solution. And if we have 
the deliberative poll participants, that random sample, rate the comments from the rest of our society, we can create a way in which no small, highly mobilized group can co-opt the conversation. We can secure the process against the, the risks of manipulation. Now, this may sound like a new process, but in fact, it comes from very old roots. The ancient Greeks used scientific random sampling. This is a picture of the Claritorium, the machine they used to pick a council of 500 people who gathered to deliberate on behalf of the entire society. They couldn't fit all of Athens on that hill. The hill wasn't big enough. So they had a random sample of people brought together to deliberate and then to structure the dialogue for everyone else. It worked for hundreds of years for them. And we have, if anything, even greater challenges of scale than they did. But just as they gave us the concept of democracy, we can also learn from their tactics. So I challenge you to think about what might be possible were we to gather back in Athens a random sample of the entire world's population. What if you had the entire world's population represented in one room in which all the elements of the world's populations from in terms of their points of view were brought together? We know that language barriers can be overcome. We did that in the European-wide deliberative poll. The Stanford Center for Deliberative Democracy conducted that process there. And we know that it is possible to then have the deliberation that happens in person be the beginning of a larger deliberation that can involve many others. What if we could scale our ability to deliberate and, or, and to secure that deliberation against any source of risk or manipulation? What if we could scale our ability to deliberate everywhere that political, is capital, that political capital is needed to take action? What if we could scale our ability to understand one another everywhere we need greater understanding in order to do what needs to be done, in order to create the infrastructure that will be needed to support 10 billion people on this planet, to address the challenge of global warming with all of the tactics that we can concur with each other that are needed? And what if we could actually overcome histories of conflict by getting people to be a, to be willing to send their kids to school with one another, even in a place where there is a history of deep conflict. I, I think that we can scale our capacity to deliberate and to create political capital everywhere it is needed. And we need to do so if we're going to overcome these challenges. Thank you.